Very good. Thank you, Brother Bob, for your help and Sister Joanna Christensen for your help. Just setting the screen, that's better. Uh, <clears throat> we've been given the topic of what is truth, fact versus uh, fiction, Brother Brian. And uh, I thought it was interesting when asking what is truth, the psalmist speaks of Jehovah. All, <laughs> all your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy states, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in uh, <clears throat> righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. So, Brother Byron, why do some uh, question the veracity of the Bible? Well, unfortunately, Brother Ray, too many people today assume that to believe the Bible, you must ignore the facts of science and history and just proceed on blind faith. Some believers relish the old saying, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. But you know, this belief doesn't fit well with either the skepticism that dominates our age, nor the admonition that Paul gives us in 1 Thessalonians 2 or 5.21, which says, examine everything carefully hold fast to that which is good now others take a different approach wanting to ignore what scripture plainly states and invent ways to harmonize the bible with modern preferences many theologians teach that the bible is only authoritative when it speaks of broad spiritual principles and suggests the details of science or history in scripture or in scripture are merely the untrustworthy additions of human writers. That last part, Brother Byron, is very concerning. Theologians doubting the scriptures. It is worrying that, the, that there was a document issued on the 5th of October in 2005 by the Roman Catholic uh, bishops from England, Scotland and Wales. In the uh, <coughs> document uh, titled The Gift of Scripture, the bishops warned that while they considered the Bible true in passages regarding uh, salvation, we would not accept total accuracy from the Bible in other matters. We would not expect to find in scripture full uh, scientific accuracy and complete historical accuracy. The first 11 chapters of Genesis and are insisting that they are not historical, that they condemn fundamentalism for its intolerance. Uh, Byron, would you uh, define truth and the difference between fact and fiction? Well, if we just go to a straight definition, uh, truth is the property of being in accord with fact or reality. In everyday language, truth is typically ascribed to things that aim to represent reality or otherwise correspond to it such as beliefs, propositions, and declarative sentences. Truth is usually held to be the opposite of falsehood. Now, fact can be defined as something that is a certainty. Facts may be understood as information that makes a true sentence true. Facts may also be understood as those things to which a true sentence refers. Now, just as example of a, a factual statement that no one would um, argue against, George Washington was the first president of the United States. That's an accepted fact. Fiction, on the other hand, is any creative work consisting of people, events, or places that are imaginary. In other words, not based strictly on history or fact. Now in its most narrow usage, fiction refers to written narratives and prose, and often specifically novels and short stories. Now in our days, we have the addition of movies, which are usually works of fiction. You know, the Star Wars films might be entertaining, but they are, in fact, fiction. That's right. Fiction is actually interesting. It could be claimed that it's telling lies. But the reality is that people know from the outset that it is fiction where the whole, or at least a portion of the story is made up, it is not meant to deceive but to entertain. Unfortunately, today we are bombarded with fiction in the form of fake news, where fiction in this case often contains lies 
that are made up as fact to intentionally deceive. And this is especially true of the information being sent out today on COVID-19 and the vaccines, Brother Byron. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Ray, that the words in our discussion today were not spoken by our Lord, nor by any of his disciples, but instead they were spoken by the appointed Roman governor of Judea. You know, his disciples had asked why he spoke in parables. They had asked him how to pray. Why were they not the ones to ask what is truth? I find that interesting. Well, we're familiar with the setting. Jesus had just been brought by the high priest Caiaphas to Pilate. The accusers would not enter the judgment hall. You know, it's interesting. They were willing to ask for the death of Jesus, but they didn't want to be defiled by any Gentile ceremonial pollution before eating the Passover. So they wouldn't even go into the hall. Pilate had to go to them and ask, what accusation do you bring against this man? The temple guards only brought the charge of him being an evildoer. The Jews had laws by which they could judge Jesus, but they wanted him to be put to death. They cleverly stated the truth that under Roman law, they could not use capital punishment, even though that this did not stop them from killing Stephen. So we find this exchange in John 18, 37 and 38 from the NASB. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose, I have been born. And for this, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And after saying this, he came out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no grounds at all for charges in his case. It certainly appears that Pilate had a good idea to what is truth when he told the chief priests and uh, <clears throat> officials in uh, Luke 23 from the Phillips translation, you have brought this man to me as a mischief maker amongst the people. And I want you to realize that after examining him in your presence, I have found nothing criminal about him in spite of all your accusations and neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Obviously, then, he has done nothing to discern the death penalty. You know, it's important, Ray, to notice that this encounter includes a blending of fact and fiction. And that's important because we know that Satan uses the same tactic to deceive God's people. In fact, the blending of fact and fiction really goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Satan entered the Garden to deceive Eve. We'd like to take a quick look at that. First, we have a fact. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. This is from Genesis 2, 16 and 17. There was no confusion on what God had told Adam and Eve, and no doubt that the death penalty would be imposed if Adam was disobedient. But we then see how Satan mixes fiction with fact. First, he uses fiction. This is Genesis 3, verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. But then he switches to fact. Now God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan's purpose was to confound the truth of God's command, and it worked. Uh, it's confirmed by Paul to Timothy when he said the woman was deceived and became a wrongdoer. It is interesting that just because it's fact does not make it right. Adam and Eve certainly learnt the truth of knowing good and evil with the death of Abel. It is interesting that Satan used this tactic in tempting Jesus in Matthew 4, 1 to 11, which we're all familiar with. Satan stated the truth. Jesus was the son of God. He, had, he no, had, no doubt had power to turn the stones into bread. He turned water to wine. And we remember that he made five loaves and two fishes feed 5,000. Satan also quoted scripture correctly, that his heavenly father would protect him if he threw himself down from the top of the temple. And uh, Satan, as the God of the world, as we have in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, 
uh, could offer the kingdoms of the world. The trap was, if you fall down and worship me. In each case, Jesus used scripture to counteract Satan with a final retort. The scriptures say, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Brother Byron. You know, Ray, it's interesting. The Pharisees used this same tactic of using truths to damage Jesus' reputation. Just Here's just a few examples. There's a statement, no prophet had come from Nazareth. No, that was fact. Up until the arrival of, of Jesus, the greatest prophet, the carpenter's son from Nazareth, he was accused of eating with publicans and sinners. That was fact. But then Jesus had come to save the lost sheep, not those who were self-righteous. Not paying temple tax was a fact. And though Jesus was not required to pay, he did. The question on paying tax to Caesar, a requirement of Roman law, was a trap to him by the Pharisees. The same trap has enticed some Christians to reject the payment of taxes despite laws requiring it, which Paul says is um, against what the scriptures say. In Romans 13, 5 through 7 from the NASB, Paul says, therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due to them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear and honor to whom honor. Yeah, there are uh, other interesting cases of facts versus uh, fiction in the Old Testament. And one that I uh, enjoy is the one that says, let uh, is Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. The king reflected and said, is this not, not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? To his subjects, he spoke fact, but to the Almighty, it was fiction. He says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared sovereignty has been removed from you and you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be amongst the beasts of the field until you recognize that the Most High is <laughs> ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes, as we have in Daniel 4, uh, 31 and 32. This came to pass as he humbled before the Almighty, Brother Byron. Yeah, it's interesting that his son learned nothing from his father's experience, um, which kind of reminds us of Israel not learning the lessons from things that went before them. In Daniel 5, verses 18 to 23, we read this about Belshazzar's experience. It says, O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him until he recognized that the most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whoever, whoever he wishes. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. You have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see, hear or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways, you have not glorified. He ignored the facts. And that night, Belshazzar lost his life and kingdom to the Medes and Persians. Yeah, the truth of God's word is often uh, shown through the fulfillment of prophecy. And one of the earliest prophecies is found in Genesis when he told Satan, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel from Genesis 3.15 was nearly 4,000 years before this prophecy would be fulfilled with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And you know, Ray, we can be sure that if a prophecy has a corresponding fulfillment, it's true. Uh, here's another prophecy that becomes truth 
when it was fulfilled. And this is from Genesis 15 verses 13 and 14. Abraham was given a vision where he was told, God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, or, he, or they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years, but I will also judge the nation whom they shall serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. And then we get the fulfillment in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. The prophecy's fulfillment starts with Abram leaving Ur to sojourn in the land, but is completed some 400 years later when Israel is released from Egypt by the Pharaoh. And we read this uh, in the fulfillment of that. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have their request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Yeah, Bar and the Apostle Paul also tells us about now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God in Galatians 3, 16 to 17. We also learned that by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for a city which had foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham did not try to claim the land, but waited patiently for God to fulfill his promise, Byron. Probably one of the best known prophecies um, in, the, in, in the Bible is recorded in Daniel, the second chapter. It starts as a dream. Uh, you, O king, speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, were looking and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and large and extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. This is from Daniel 2, verses 31 to 33. Now, his wise men could not help the king, and it was Daniel who interpreted the dream. Daniel spoke of the golden head as being Nebuchadnezzar and that there would be three inferior kingdoms that would come after him, which would rule over much of the earth, but specifically over Israel. And eventually the last kingdom would be replaced with a kingdom that would last forever. So now we get to the fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, the first four kingdoms have been identified by historians as the Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman empires. These identifications have come through the workings of history, matching further prophecies. The dream in Daniel chapter 7 gives more details about the nature of each kingdom, how they would come to power, which history affirms is accurate. The third one's interesting, described as a leopard with four wings. Alexander the Great died shortly after swiftly conquering the Medes and Persian empires, and his kingdom was divided amongst his four generals. It's interesting that our Lord, during his first advent, spoke of prophecies being fulfilled or proven. It's interesting that while he was in the synagogue, he read from uh, the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favourable year of the Lord. Jesus made that statement, <clears throat> this statement, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing in Luke 4 and 21, 
offering proof of the truth of God's word. He had come to bring a message of salvation to the lost sheep. The prophecy of his birth found in Micah, but as for you, Bethlehem Ephratah, too little to be amongst the clans of Judah. From you, one will come forth to me to be a ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. It's interesting that this was fulfilled with the uh, birth of uh, Jesus as recorded in Luke 2, 4 to 7. However, it took a decree from Caesar to make this happen as Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth at the time and showed the great foreknowledge of the heavenly father in knowing the decree that Caesar would make. Byron. Yeah, you know, this shows that sometimes prophecies are not as easy to understand or to prove. Uh, the statement of Matthew about Joseph's return from Egypt is one such case. Uh, then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. The statement in John 146, can anything good come out of Nazareth, gives a clue to the riddle. It points to the verse in Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. How true his upbringing, he was despised. They ask of him, is not this not the carpenter's son? And Jesus acknowledged this fact with the statement, a prophet has not honor in his own country. Now, these are a couple of good examples of historical truth found in the Bible. Yeah, when we first started this discussion on what is truth, you mentioned that some say to believe the Bible, you must ignore the facts of science. It is interesting that when Jehovah was speaking with uh, Job, speaking of his power, he states, can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loosen the cords of iron? Can you <clears throat> lead forth a consolation in its seasons and guide the bear with his satellites? It's interesting how long it took to prove this, Brother Byron. Yeah, and it's also interesting to know that um, and realize that man has always been fascinated with the creations of the heavens. Um, man has always gone out at night, looked in the heavens, and they've recognized certain features of the heaven. Um, one of those, a couple of those features are mentioned here in, in God's words to uh, Job when he mentions the Pleiades and the uh, belt of Orion. Uh, Galileo was the first astronomy, astronomer to view the Pleiades through a telescope in 1610, and he counted 36 stars. Well, the number has risen since to more than 1,000 stars in the group. John Mitchell circulated in 1767 that the probability of a chance alignment of so many bright stars was only one in 500,000 and so surmised that the Pleiades and many other clusters of stars must be physically related. When studies were first made of the Pleiades stars' proper motions, it was found that they were all moving in the same direction across the sky and at the same rate, further demonstrating that they were related. It's as if Jehovah was saying, hey, Job, can you keep Pleiades together? Well, I can. Uh, now, unlike the Pleiades clusters, the stars of Orion's belt do not share a common trajectory, and in the course of time, Orion's belt will eventually drift out of their alignment. It's as if Jehovah was saying, hey, Job, you think you can loosen Orion's belt? Well, I can. Here's some scientific proof about uh, the heavens that we so admire God's creating. It was interesting because also it wasn't until the 1500s that uh, the scientists discovered that the Earth rotated around the sun. And the uh, movement of the constellations is caused by the Earth's orbit around our sun. In the summer, viewers are looking at a different direction in space at night than they are during the winter. And as a result, again, it is God that guides the constellations in their seasons. 
Another interesting fact is described in the Bible, the water cycle. And we have several passages of scripture that describe this cycle. In Job, we are told, for he draweth up the drops of water, which distill in rain from his vapor, when the skies pour down and drop upon man abundantly. We also have uh, later on, he wraps up the waters in his clouds and the clouds do not burst under them. And then we have all the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full to the place where the rivers flow. There they flow again, as in Ecclesiastes. But Byron, uh, I don't think it was uh, took a long while for man to prove this. Well, no, it didn't. And we have scientific proof of these statements in the Bible concerning this water cycle. Um, these questions were not understood until the 17th century when French scientists Pierre Perrault and Edme Marriott developed the concept of the hydrologic cycle. And you know, today, um, this water cycle is taught in schools as early as the second grade. It's that simple. And it's basically made up of four points. This is what the hydrologic water cycle states. And it's in full accordance to what you just read in scripture, Brother Ray. First, water from rivers flows into the oceans. Then water evaporates from the oceans into clouds. Water returns to land in the form of rain from the clouds. And then the water drains from the land back into the rivers. So here's this perpetuating cycle that the Bible speaks of. And so we looked at the heavens, we looked at the water cycle. These are just two of the scientific uh, established facts of the Bible. So science is a huge part of the truth of scripture, Brother Ray. Impatient with God's timetable and tries to bring his promises to fruition ahead of time. On such cases, was with, one such case was with Abram when he tried to provide an heir. <clears throat> Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Elanias of <clears throat> Damascus? Abraham said, Since you have given me no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. But it's interesting that God replied to him, this man will not be your heir, but one which comes forth from your own body, and he shall be your heir. Abraham had to learn patience, Byron. Well, it's very true, Brother Ray, and his wife, Sarah, also had to learn patience. And she had to learn faith that God would provide an heir from her old body. You know, she tried to hurry the process along, telling Abram in Genesis 16, 2, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So they were both impatient and uh, listening, trying to do things on their own rather than waiting on the Lord. Sarah thought she was helping, but the result was conflict between Ishmael and Isaac that remains till this very day. Yeah, another promise that uh, man has tried to bring forward actually relates to Israel. The promise was, therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brings up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord that lives, which brings up the sons of Israel, from the lands of the north and from all the countries where he had banished them. For I will restore them to their own land, which I give to, gave to their fathers in Jeremiah 16, 14 to 15. It is interesting that some of the Jews thought they could help with the fulfillment with several solutions. In uh, 1939, the Free Land uh, League for Jewish Territorial Colonialism identified the Kimberleys in uh, Western Australia as a place to settle 75,000 European Jews fleeing from rampant anti-Semitism. I don't think they ever visited it, 
because for three to four months of the year, it is flooded by tropical rain and you can't move anywhere. But they did come up with another suggestion at that time for southwest of, us, uh, of Tasmania. Again, an isolated and very rugged land. This was in 1941. Maybe they should have remembered the last part of the prophecy, for I will restore them to their lands, which I give to their fathers. Byron. Yeah, thank you, Ray. You know, as we just mentioned, patience is a large part of um, our lives and waiting on the Lord. Uh, but I have a question about distinguishing the truth as fact and fiction. And this comes from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, where Paul said, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So this sounds like a large obstacle, Brother Ray. How are we to overcome this veiling process? It is interesting that it's the apostle Peter that tells us that we need the Holy Spirit to unlock the mysteries of God. Um, he says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what, time, what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look in 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. So we see the need of the Holy Spirit, Byron. Yeah, how true that is, Brother Ray, and how true the statement, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. This was certainly the charge when Jesus said, woe unto you lawyers, for ye took away the key of knowledge. Ye entered in not yourselves, but them that were not entering, but them that were entering, and ye hindered. That's from Luke eleven fifty two. You know, Albert Barnes, a uh, noted Bible scholar, makes a comment on this that, that I appreciate. A key is made to open a lock or door by their false interpretation of the Old Testament. They had taken away the true key or method of understanding it. They had hindered the people from understanding it aright. You endeavor to prevent the people also from understanding the scriptures respecting the Messiah and those who were coming to me, ye hindered. I like that uh, comment, Brother Ray. Yeah, I think that is the fact and we do have to be careful that we don't hinder, hinder those that are searching for the truth. It's been a very interesting discussion, but uh, what do we take away from this discussion on truth, fact or fiction, Byron? Well, I think we can return by, start by returning to where we began, and that's Jesus' answer to Pilate in John 18, 37, uh, where we read, therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. And I think that should be the core of our thoughts today, that Jesus came to testify to the truth. And then he adds, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. It's a truth. It's a fact that God cannot lie. It's also truth and a fact that God's only begotten son was made into a perfect man to be the corresponding price for Adam. By his own words, Jesus told us that truth are in his words. So we would do well to study in depth the words of Jesus. Uh, a second point I think we could take out of this. The Apostle Paul did not encourage first century Christians to just believe in Jesus and merely accept the teachings of the Bible and Christianity on faith. Instead, he told his audiences, test all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Paul urged people to check into the facts and believe 
what they could prove to be true. Paul knew that true religious belief involves evidence, assurance, and certainty, not blind faith. I think this is one of the reasons he praised the Berean brethren for studying the scriptures daily to make sure he was speaking the truth. Paul wrote that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen in Hebrews 11.1. 1. So we should remember finding truth and differentiating between fact and fiction requires work on our part. And then a third point, Brother Ray, that I mentioned is that we should be aware that Satan will very often blend fact with fiction to distort the truth. And we've seen that in the last few years. You know, there's a phrase that's come out the last few years about alternative facts. And some people are basing their religious belief even on alternative facts, facts which they make up to um, maybe promote something that appeals to them personally. But we, we want to resist that, uh, that temptation. So what are your final thoughts on our discussion, Brother Ray? I think it's been a very interesting discussion, and you brought out the point of proving the fact, <clears throat> proving from Scripture. And, of course, this was one of the points that Pastor Russell emphasized so often, that we weren't to accept what was written uh, by man, and he included himself in that, without proving it from the Scriptures. And I think one of the interesting points there was that the Apostle Peter emphasized the uh, credibility of the scriptures when he wrote, for we do not follow cunning devised fables, which as you have mentioned is one of the problems of today. Um, when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, as he said in 2 Peter 1 and 16. But he also warns us, be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, because scoffers will come in the last days, questioning and ridiculing scripture, saying, where is the promise of his coming? And that's 2 Peter 3, 1 to 9. Peter challenged prevailing misconceptions about the scriptures. He did not try to water down fundamental Spirit, scriptural teachings. And this is something that we must be aware of. We cannot um, water down the truth to make our message uh, more palatable to people, to win over more souls, as some of them uh, say. If you, if you give the message right, you can get more people in. But we have to give God's message, not our message. Have you got any closing thought? Byron. No, I, I would just emphasize your last point. It, every, every statement we made on uh, about the Bible and God's plan needs to come from proven scriptures uh, that we can rely on and attest to. And through an examination of some of these uh, prophecies that were made uh, that we see have come true, some of the uh, scientific evidences which we've looked into today, I think all of these point to um, the, the greater promises of God to bless the world of mankind in the future, that we can rely on that as fact based on all the other fulfillments and scientific fulfillments we've seen.